got review. This is the fifth one, you might as well watch the others, but whatever. Hey guys, did you know that people have like, opinions about Catelyn Stark? Catelyn Tully is the worst person that's ever lived. selfish, and deplorable sociopath. You might think Cersei Lannister is a better person than her. Please, shut the fuck up! I get the feeling that analyzing her role in the story from a more functional perspective is a more productive exercise than proving that the woman is evil, but different strokes for different blokes, I guess. Somewhere out there, there's this vein of discourse about whether Catelyn is a fierce, independent, strong leader who does everything she can to support her family, or a vile, incompetent, fickle moron who couldn't make a good decision if it came in a flat pack. And while it would be convenient for me to ignore this joke, reveal debate, it would also be rather disingenuous. So let's go ahead and not do that. Get hyped because it's time for some motherfucking nuance. Yeah! And Billy Joel. She can kill with a smile, she can wound with her eyes. Like the rest of her family, Kat is in the first scene at Winterfell, which of course is show only. She's introduced by John as Bran's mother. And your mother. In contrast to Ned, who is just father. So without even pointing out the distinction, John's language subtly tells the audience the family relationship, which means that at the end of the scene, when Kat glares at him, the viewer may intuit the reason for her visible disdain towards him without being told anything directly. I feel the need to point out that this was written by Benioff and Weiss, the same guys who wrote A Finger in the Bomb and You want a good girl, but you need a bad pussy. And Break on. Dick on. <laughs> Almost as though they could write some very tight stuff using characters and plots that had already been thought through, but as soon as they start coming up with things on their own, they blow absolute chunks. Anyway, Kat doesn't actually do anything aside from look at stuff until Sir Roderick comes in and Theon kind of just apparates next to him. Did you see that? How did he do that? So Ned needs to go execute a guy for crossing the border without applying for a work visa and Kat seems to disagree with this custom. Not vibing with traditions and laws sets her apart as a foreigner, which again is exposition for the character without directly stating anything. Kat thinks Bran is too young to see someone's head get unstuck, but Ned settles the issue by saying a catchphrase and walking away. And winter is coming. Which is how my parents dealt with arguments too. This leaves Cat to angrily brood at Ned's angrily brooding bastard. A shame they don't get along, they have so much in common. I guess she walks through Winterfell. Then she tells Ned that the guy who raised him is dead, Lamau Cop, that idiot. Nah, actually first they chat about how she isn't from here and that both of their religions are wacky. It's never mentioned in the show that the Winterfell Sept was built specifically for Catelyn, which I guess goes to show how accommodating Ned was to his relatively foreign wife. All these years and I still feel like an outsider when I come here. This line is pulling a lot of weight to account for the monologue we lose in adaptation. Deadly Nedley reckons that living somewhere for the better part of two decades and raising a huge ass family there isn't much of an outsider trait, but Kat still prays differently to everyone else. Every little line tells you something more about the characters and the world they live in. Each sentence so rife with information. Anyway, the actual plot of the scene is that John Aaron is dead and Robert is coming north. Kat has read Ned's email, which makes her a conniving fiend and not, as you might think, his spouse of two decades and the Lady of Winterfell. And it's not like there's any possibility that as a loving married couple with a huge overlap in shared interests they've decided that sharing this kind of thing is perfectly fine. And there's absolutely no chance that I'm just throwing shade out of spite because I'm annoyed that, in the interest of fairness, I had to watch that entire series while researching for this video. It's not like I lose sleep at night wondering why finding proof that Rob's mum sucks is so important to you that you have to painstakingly ignore the context of all her actions for three and a half fucking hours and have the absolute goal to title it a theory. You know, every POV character in the series constantly makes terrible decisions. It just seems weird to me that you would focus on her in particular. By the way, if you're wondering why the pond is so reflective, it's because this isn't water. It's actually black paint. That's why the leaves look kind of wrong. So Robert's on his way and both husband and wife immediately intuit what he wants, whereas in the song neither of them mention or think about it. This gives the scene in Thrones a more grim air and gives the audience a short little mystery concerning what it is that Robert wants from Ned. Your sister, the boy. They both have their health. So that was a fucking lie. Little extra scene where the hole is being prepared. Beyond indicating the passage of time and the mass effort required to prepare for the royal party, this scene actually works to exposit about Tyrion more than anything else. All we learn about Kat is that she has a non-zero amount of authority at Winterfell and that she's racist towards dwarves. A man of his 
Statue. Shortly before the king's arrival, Kat handily lampshades the dire wolf's growth. Oh God, but they grow fast. And Hobby shames her son, even though climbing is epic. No climbing. At least he's not like planking or watching anime. This isn't in the song and basically serves to give us literally anything between Bran and Kat, seeing as she leaves Winterfell before he wakes up. She tells Bran to go find his dad. Bye, Bran! They're all waiting for the king and Kat's one short on her head count. Where's Arya? She asks Sansa where Arya is as though it's her responsibility, and her response is iconic. She kneels for the king, obviously, before we get what is somehow, in spite of very strong competition, Robert's best line. Cat. The best dialogue the showrunners ever wrote. Then Robert steals Ned to go talk to a statue, so the scene ends. Then there's another extra one with Sansa. These extra scenes where Cat is a mother to her children before shit starts to go south doesn't entirely compensate for the lost internal monologues, but it's good that this is what the leftover runtime was devoted to. God knows it could have gone somewhere far less productive. It's easy to forget, for me at least, that these scenes are show only, and that's because their actual content is a generally drawn in part from the source in some way, and two topical, sensible, and non-obtrusive. Of course Sansa would talk to her mother about her insecurities and the handsome prince she's going to marry. It wasn't written in the book, but for all we know it absolutely could have happened. The scene has Kat quell her daughter's worries, support her self-esteem, display cynicism to contrast Sansa's naive dreams, and most importantly express why Ned shouldn't accept the handship, namely that he'd have to leave his family and home. Sansa reminds Kat that she once left her home behind, and begs her to make Ned accept. At the big party they're throwing for her husband's friend, Kat silently sits at the big kid's table with her husband's friend's wife in front of a pile of food. The awkward chit-chat she attempts to make is something all middle-aged white women are familiar with. Is this your first time in the North, Your Grace? Yes. Ask her how the weather was on the trip. Cersei meets Sansa and tells her that she's hot. You are a beauty. Before asking if she's insert euphemism for period here. Yes. And have you bled yet? Sansa hasn't insert slightly more ridiculous euphemism for period here yet, so Cersei compliments her clothes and sends her on her way. Cersei brings up that she and Kat might be future co-grandmothers to one of those infant things before throwing enough shade to cool down a yacht. Such a beauty shouldn't stay hidden up here forever. Fuck man, you're just gonna sit there and take that? Then Kat makes Rob take Arya to bed. It's cute, but I already used my joke for it in the last one, so. Though they spend scant time together, Ned and Kat constitute one of the more convincing loving couples across the show. You could attribute this to decent casting and performances, but I think the writing is more than pulling its weight to accomplish this. Kat makes her husband laugh. I'll say, listen. Man. While they're sorting out a legitimate issue facing their family. Pretty good. Characterization woven into dialogue that isn't necessarily about characterization. If you hadn't noticed it yet, I kind of have a thing for things that do more than one thing in a thing. So Kat really doesn't want Ned to go to King's Landing, which she's expressed a few times already, while Ned feels obliged to accept the handship. In the song, this is reversed, with Ned reluctant to leave his family and Kat worried what offending Robert might mean for them. Neither situation is poorly construed, so the difference doesn't matter much, but I'd say that the treatment in Thrones actually actually makes a bit more sense. Lewin shows up with news from Lysa, delivered by a rider in the night. In the song, this is way more convoluted, with the letter being hidden behind a false bottom in a box that showed up in Lewin's lab while he was having a kip. I'd reckon that this was done by a Littlefinger stooge, but that's neither hither nor thither. What's important is that in Thrones, this extremely sensitive information is being handled by a rider in the night. I get that we don't exactly have the time to go into all the wacky details Gurm fills his story with, but it just irks me ever so slightly, especially considering that Liza's head would be on a spike right now if the wrong people had found that letter. Not exactly a big issue, but it could very easily have made a lot more sense. Catelyn is surprised and startled that Lysa is at the Eyrie instead of King's Landing, even though it really isn't that crazy. What's she doing at the Eyrie? Anyway, Cat tells Ned that John Aaron was murdered by the Lannisters. <laughs> Book Catelyn named Cersei specifically, so it seems that the show kept it intentionally vague to present House Lannister as the unified antagonistic force the Stark parents see them as. The audience sees this idea dismantled by the Tyrion story, but Cat obviously isn't privy to that. She plays either the angel or the devil on Ned's shoulder, depending on your perspective, telling him that for his own safety he must stay at Winterfell, while Lewin counters her with Robert's safety. In the song, they both agree that he should go to the capital. The culmination of this is that in Thrones, Ned goes against his wife's advice, and she's not so happy about that. Not that she's terribly thrilled about it in the song, but at least they all agree. We miss out on all the hoopla around where the kids will go, Cat yelling about Jon Snow and Lewin swooping in to get rid of him for her. Some of this is worked into the next episode, so I guess it's time to finally shut up about this one. Get used to seeing this room, by the way. Bran's having a nap and Cat's having an extra scene, and she's making 
one of these things. Cersei walks in and is actually pretty nice to her. I would have addressed your grace. Says your home, I'm your guest. Before she talks about the baby the show invented for her. And this isn't just a weird random lie she tells Catelyn as she later discusses the child with Robert. So it's a sincere moment where she genuinely tries to connect and relate to Cat, making Cersei a more sympathetic character even though we've been told she was involved in a murder. It would have been interesting to see her opinion on Cersei change because of this, but ultimately this scene is largely irrelevant aside from contributing to the slow roll of Cersei's development. Cat and Cersei never talk again and this conversation is never brought up directly. Don't get me wrong though, it's a great scene. Next, Kat's making one of these things. They say her mother's work is never done. John walks in, which offends her greatly. John is notably more based in the book when Kat threatens to call the guards to get him out and he calls her bluff. She remarks that her wish to have Bran stay has been granted, briefly letting her walls down around John before telling him to fuck off and saying that it should have been him. Here in the show, there is no such glimpse of vulnerability and the hostility is toned down. I want you to leave. Okay, so this scene is often used to point out that Catelyn is an irrationally horrible devil spawn as though her behaviour isn't explained moments later. To Cat, John is a symbol of Ned's infidelity, and that's all he is. Yes, how dare she fail to imagine him complexly as though emotions have the best of her. In the song, she further elucidates that it's not the fact that Ned had a bastard she has a problem with, it's that he brought the bastard home to be raised among her own children. You can see why that would be difficult for someone, especially someone raised to believe that their family is the most important thing. Family comes first. And maybe such a person would be prone to snapping at someone if their beloved son was on death's door right in front of them. Just maybe. So if you think that Joffrey or Tywin or Cersei or Peter or any of a whole bunch of others are well-written characters because of the terrible things they do have rationales you could expect from a real person, but think that Cat being mean to Jon crosses a line that makes her an irredeemable bitch, I have to wonder why that is. And that's all I'm arguing here, by the way, is that she's well-written and complex and understandable. Not saying you have to like her, just that, like, she makes sense. A middle-aged white woman being cold to someone who she perceives to be an affront to her family is actually one of the most believable things in this entire series. Look, actions being illogical or irrational doesn't mean they're unbelievable. Real people are illogical and irrational with alarming frequency. Realistic characters should be too. And seriously, how boring would stories be if everyone got along? Cat hating John just for the mere reality of his existence is a much needed upset to the idea family life of Winterfell. It makes that place so much more interesting. Why you bore me? I'm right. This is a really good scene and a big moment of characterization for both Jon and Catelyn. Anyway, she's also mad offline at Ned for leaving her, but he tells her to grow a pair and walks away. For all they know, they won't see each other for years. Bye, son! And if you do hate her, then at least you get some catharsis out of this scene. Lewin comes in to talk about money and feeling household positions because he can't read a room. I don't care about appointments. Can't you see she's busy making one of these things? Rob takes charge, which is super cool of him. Lewin, who is also four separate characters in the Doctor Who universe, by the way, fucks right off to clear the room for the cat's paw. Rob's like, what the fuck are you still doing here, mum? We need you. Rickon's gonna become a cannibal. But she's still busy making these things. She throws a tanty at all the wolves howling and Rob notices a fire that he didn't see 30 seconds earlier. Must have been one of those sneaky fires you hear about. He says, You stay here, I'll come back. Which is a little hilarious. Rob also fucks off to make room for the cat's paw. It'd get really stuffy in here with all those people. Now I don't know about you guys, but I know for an absolute fact that the cat's paw was actually, in reality, really, in fact, and here's the real truth, it turns out, genuinely, no bamboozles, here it is, I'm ready to say it, the person for whom the cat's paw was working. That's right, indeed, the employer of the aforementioned scoundrel, the dastardly deed doer's daring director, me! I did it! It was me! Thank you! Sorry, don't tell anyone! It's funny that he goes to slit her throat. Are we gonna call that foreshadowing? Uh, fuck it. Anyway, the moron I hired couldn't even kill a cat, let alone a dog, so I had to get him throat replacement surgery. Cost me an arm and a leg. His ones, obviously. Where was I? Oh yeah, thanks as of yet, unnamed direwolf. Wonder what that was all about. I guess she walks through Winterfell again. Now suspicious that something fishy is going on. Ha <laughs> ha! Tully puns! Cat finally leaves Bran alone for a single fucking moment, come on mum, you're smothering me to inspect the site of his fall. She finds a single long blonde hair after 10 seconds of looking and thankfully did not bring a black light. This is an extra scene that replaces a few minor events and some major introspection where Kat evaluates her recent behaviour and starts feeling ashamed. Perhaps the showrunners thought that a piece of evidence linking Cersei to the scene of the crime would give Lady Stark a more compelling reason to go to King's Landing, instead of going just to inform Ned of what's happened. Although 
Well, I would argue that Jamie not joining the King's Hunt on the day Bran fell, coupled with the dagger's quality, is a good enough reason to go, but honestly, I've been talking for way too long anyway. So she gathers Rob, Theon, Lewin, and Roderick to spread the goss. Fuck knows why she invited Theon to a secret meeting in the Godswood. It's not like he really does anything in the scene. Kinda seems like they're just giving him as much screen time as possible to prep us for season two. Kat does most of the intellectual heavy lifting through the meeting. I don't know. And everyone seems to generally agree with her. Rob and Theon are speaking of war, and Lewin tells them to pull their heads in. Ned needs to know about this, and... I don't trust a raven to carry these words. But apparently a rider in the night is good enough for Lysa. Yes, I'm still salty! Obviously the environment down here is all salt. The, the ceiling's salt, the floor is salt, the walls are salt and to an extent the air is soft. Rob offers to ride to the capital, but there must always be a stock in Winterfell. Kat says she'll go instead and has a moment of hesitation before accepting Roderick's company. So was she planning on going alone? Are you serious? Kat's made one of these things and farewells Bran who is still having a nap. It's Sunday, he's having a long one. Probably worth it considering that she never makes it back to him. Kat and Roderick teleport to King's Landing. <laughs> Funny joke. But no, don't be silly. It's been 35 minutes of screen time spanning two episodes since they left Winterfell and a bunch of other events have happened and their arrival isn't at war with the timing of anything else. Characters moving quickly can be perfectly fine when it isn't contradictory to the pace of other events. Like, it's sensible to assume that several weeks have passed since they left Winterfell, whereas for an example of actual teleporting, in The Queen's Justice, Euron ambushes the Unsullied at Casterly Rock even though he left much later than them and the events portrayed in the episode must occur within less time than it would take for him to pull this off. So let's stop accusing season one of the same egregious teleporting shenanigans, shall we? Anyway, the timing is rather different to the song as Book Cat takes a ship from White Harbor and gets to the capital before Ned. Immediately after claiming that nobody will recognize her, she gets recognized. It's nine years since I set foot in the capital and no one knew who I was the last time I came either. Lady. Welcome to King's Landing, Lady Star. Do you mind us to the city? Instructed? This introduces us to the idea that there are certain characters who are extremely competent, active, and top sneaky. Ah oh, well. Cats. Another bang up line of dialogue. Unfortunately, because Cat arrives after Ned in the show, this isn't our first scene with Peter and Varys, but more on that some other time. Fairly does a great job of being outraged. You take me for some back alley Sally you can drag into a- I love how Varys is just weirdly lurking in the background until Peter cues him. Catelyn wants to know how Peter knew she was coming, but he just says he did it. And then when she asks him, he pulls some magicians don't reveal their secrets bullshit. Knowledge is my trade, my lady. Yeah, right, yeah. Hack. Song Roderick was sent off to talk to some guy and isn't at this meeting, but in the show he kinda just hangs about. All this really means is that Varys' knowledge of the dagger is even spookier. But him don't know to whom it belongs to, so Peter has to fill in the blanks. He says, There's only one dagger like this in all of the Seven Kingdoms. So why would you wager it? I don't know, it just seems like a kind of a dumb thing to do. So he lies about losing the dagger to Tyrion, but the show never tells us that he actually lost it to Robert, so did he even lose it at all? Was it his dagger all along? Was it Littlefinger behind the cat's paw? Absolutely it was. Also, how the fuck did he even get this thing in the first place? Not season one's fault that this isn't answered, of course, but please, HBO, just a crumb of explanation. Good scene, though. Epic, dramatic ending. Tyrion Lannister, the imp. Next, Cat. pops her head through a window to stop Ned from killing Peter because she knows that seasons two through four just wouldn't be the same without him. That's the scene. She literally just says, Ned. And that's my analysis. Peter tells them that they can't just bloody well walk in and say the Lannisters are murderers. We have proof. And that it'd be Tyrion's word against theirs, which of course doesn't convince anyone of anything. You said, I did warn you not to trust me. He's like a little brother to me, Ned. Some friend zoning is inevitable. You're a true friend. You can actually pinpoint the second when his heart rips in half. And now. Now this is a more appropriate farewell, seeing as they've both come to terms with the situation for the most part. Ned tells Kat to watch her temper and that actually is foreshadowing. Then he says that Peter still loves her because he has eyes. They have their last kiss ever and some very convincing acting faces. Ned will die before Kat can see him again and she'll die before he can see her and vice versa. In the book he gives her a bunch of specific tasks to take care of when she gets home but circumstances change rather rapidly. A pitfall of this method of analysis is that because I'm only talking about scenes with Kat, 
we missed the juxtaposition of the Stark parents and the Lannister siblings. Except I still brought it up by complaining about how I couldn't bring it up. Because this is my video and I can talk about whatever I want. For example, did you know that there was a tortoise who met both Charles Darwin and Steve Irwin? Fucking crazy. Anyway, both the castles are in this scene and they don't look at each other long. Bye, husband! Bye, wife! Hmm, maybe this scene will prove once and for all that Catelyn is a terrible character. Oh wait, it's completely rational given the information she has. God, Marillion is a prick. Singers suck. Glad I can't sing. No, really, just imagine the tragedy that could be avoided if he hadn't drawn Tyrion's attention to Cat. Okay, so she goes down a checklist of her father's bannermen and asks this inn full of folks to put Tyrion in time out. It's very explicit in the song that these people are all on their way to the hand's tourney, and while the same can be inferred here, one can't be blamed for questioning why all these Nights are at some random fucking inn. Though a lot seems to happen at this random fucking inn. Sort of makes you wonder if there's more to it. So, is Cat capturing Tyrion here a poor idea? Well, no fucking doy it is, but she doesn't know Tyrion like we do. And Littlefinger has played off her emotional response to the injustices against her family and has her utterly convinced that Tyrion is responsible. From her perspective, she's been ambushed by the man who tried to kill her son after his brother's failed attempt. She can't very well let him go free in spite of her husband's cautioning. And if you're calling character's bad for being manipulated, then there go basically all of the points of view. It's not like Kat's an idiot. You said we were riding for Winterfell. I did. Often and loudly. Very wise. Like she actually employed a little bit of deception here. Oh, the fucking singer's still here. I hope you die. I hope an incident in which you might die occurs soon. Tell me, Lady Stark, when was the last time you saw your sister? Five years ago. Okay, let's figure this out. Lysa lived in King's Landing until John died. She hasn't been back there since her wedding. And Kat says, It's nine years since I set foot in the capital. And we know that Lysa would never leave her son's side, so did John visit Winterfell with his family five years ago and we just don't know about it? I doubt Robert would have missed an excuse to see Ned. Or did they have a family brunch at River Run? Apparently Sansa has met Lysa though, but not show Sansa. It's wonderful to meet you, Aunt Lysa. It's just a little weird. It's in both book and show when there's no clear explanation in either case. Anyway, Tyrion's adamant that he didn't try to kill Bran, but what would you even know? Some sort of imbecile arms an assassin with his own blade. Counter-argument, you're short. Apparently, singing and playing a... A, a zither? Would you call that a zither? Whatever it is, playing it attracts all of the singles in your area. And boy, are they ready to mingle. Man, I forgot how badass the as of yet unnamed Bronn is in this fight. Kat isn't entirely unwilling to reason with Tyrion, who returns the favor of untying him by shafting this local bachelor. Roderick sustains a boo-boo, and Kat pretends not to hear Tyrion's joke about doing a sex to her. Ah, and the idiots didn't even kill the fucking singer! There's no bloody gate in season one, even though in season four, Peter confirms that it's the only way to get into the Eyrie. If you want to get to the Eyrie, you need to go through the bloody gate. The Eyrie is, shall we say, generally more reasonable than in the song, and that's saying a lot because it's still pretty unreasonable. There's also no Blackfish, even though he's cool, and this guy is not very cool. Anyway, after Vardis is a bit of a bastard, he admits them to the Eyrie, which, let's be upfront, is an awesome name for a castle. In the song, Lysa waits until she's alone with Kat to scold her for bringing Tyrion to her, but here she seems more openly lunatical, bringing up her issues in front of Vardis, her son, Tyrion and himself and a shit ton of guards. Cat doesn't get up to much in these scenes as the conflict here is basically between Tyrion and Lysa now. Between deciding to take Tyrion to the Vale and reuniting with Rob, she's kind of just a vehicle for the plot or a window for the audience. So forgive me if I can't find some deep meaning behind her standing with contempt. She kind of just starts the war and then sits the first little bit out. Nothing wrong with relegating her to the sidelines though, it makes sense. Watching her come to the realization that her sister has gone cuckoo banana pants is a total mood though. Robin, not Robert wants to geek Tyrion, but Kat institutes a vibe check. This man is my prisoner. Lysa fails the check and imprisons Tyrion on her own terms. It's fun to see Tyrion and Kat agree with each other about Lysa. Is that the bad man? Okay, given that they both lived in King's Landing together for years, it seems unlikely that Robin, who's like eight or nine or something and should be able to remember people pretty well, especially people with any notable features, wouldn't know who Tyrion is. Like, why is he so amazed at the dwarf? He's little. Surely he's seen him before, like a bunch. Oh yeah, I have to commend Nina Gold again. Michelle Fairley and Kate Dickey are very believable as sisters. Good job. Cat stands with contempt while the funny dwarf rehearses his tight five for the open mic night at the King's Landing Comedy Club. Goat shit. Ha! Again, Catelyn does fuck all aside from restating what Tyrion's been accused of. Lysa shows off her big hole in the floor. What if I refuse? Then you'll be fired. Fine. Out of a cannon into the sun. And Cat 
looks pensively at her sister when Tyrion demands a drive-by wombat or something. I wasn't really listening. She continues to stand. Look, look. I've talked about this before from Tyrion's perspective, so whatever. So Bronn fights Sir Vingen and Cat watches. Lysra is confident that Vangans will win, but at least in the song, Cat is worried that Bronn will win and doesn't like the trial because Tyrion is no use to them dead. This is such a cool duel, by the way. Like, we barely know either of the people fighting at this point, but we're still invested in the stakes. Apparently, Jerome Flynn actually fell through the moon door in one of the takes. Clumsy idiot. Cat is disappointed that the captive she took that started the war is going free, but rules is rules and she allows him his purse back. Little man is going home. I mean, via a battlefield, but sure. Like mother, like daughter, Catelyn is not in this episode. So it's been a hot minute and a few things have happened, so we need an extra scene to catch Cat up. She barges in on Lysa, fucking furious that she's been withholding important information. Fair enough, go off, Queen. This is the angriest we've seen her so far, aside from maybe when Peter brought her into the brothel and fairly plays it superbly. Bravo. Cat is a passionate woman. There's some hard hitting analysis for you. My husband has been taken prisoner. My son intends to declare war. Yeah, and the king is dead. Lysa confirms that she's going to remain neutral in the war. The knights of the will stay in the Vale where they belong. Which you could hand wave as her being nuts or legitimately concerned with the Vale, but it could also be seen as mounting evidence that her motivations are not consistent and there's a big lie central to this whole conflict. Because earlier she seemed really invested in the idea of Tyrion dying, which would surely mean an invasion of the Vale. An invasion, if you will. And if you won't, maybe someone else will. Speaking of someone else, Kat and Roderick arrive at Moat Caelan or something like that. They've come from the south, it seems, and it's just the two of them as opposed to the host she picks up from White Harbor in the song, having sent Roderick back to Winterfell. Mother and son refrain from embracing in front of all his men because apparently loving your mum makes you weak. Hashtag end toxic masculinity. Great John has protagonist syndrome and feels the need to talk at every given opportunity. Cat chides Rob for leading the host himself, but what's done is done and turns out Rob is a little military hot shot so no harm done. Oh, some harm done. Catelyn makes it clear that either they win or they die, given that their opponent is Tywin Lannister. It's a line that really feels like it belongs in the previous episode, you win or you die, but ideas don't have to be confined to a single episode, obviously. Cat really wants to go home, but Rob needs her counsel more than Bran does. And Rickon will be fine, don't worry about him. At a strategic meeting, Rob states that all of their viable options require crossing at the twins, and Cat gives us some exposition on Lord Walder Frey. Some men take their oaths more seriously than others. It makes sense that she would have this reductive view on oaths, seeing as she has a vested interest, but Frey's point of conflicting oaths, in this case to your liege lord and to your king, is not to be ignored. Rob is faced with a decision, either rout Tywin or break Jaime's siege of Riverrun, and before he reaches a verdict, they're interrupted by the scout. At the risk of this turning into a Rob review, he demonstrates a keen mind and kind morals when dealing with this kid. Cat makes this face, which could be disbelief, stoic pride, or just plain old boredom. It seems to be more of a moment between Rob and Roderick. Cat speaks up when he lets the guy go, but realizes that her son is a leader now and must make his own decisions. None of my kids made it to this age, but it must be a lot to go through, realizing that your son is now his own person and can make his own decisions, some of the time. He even stands his ground against Great John. Theon kills a raven and I'll never forgive him. Keep shooting them down. Oh, okay. Never mind. I completely agree now. She's the fucking devil. After considering their options and knowing that the only way through is peacefully, Kat decides to bargain with Walder herself. I have known Lord Walder since I was a girl. He would never harm me. I'll find another. Hey look, it's the same joke again. You love it when I do that. I fucking love David Bradley. This guy is a king. Walder Frey doesn't give a single shit about anyone and he gets that across extremely well and extremely quickly. You come for Like imagine addressing someone this important like this. Is there somewhere we can talk? Right now. This is the closest look we ever get of the Frey family who are all over the damn place in the song. See how they pile up? The guy doesn't understand how plants work though. A little flower. And the honey is all mine. It's a little weird how nobody else has built a bridge across the trident, but whatever, this scene runs really similar to the song. Cat demonstrates her use as a statesman, and while this scene ends rather negatively, she returns with good news and bad news. Ugh, why don't people stand when I enter a room? Lord Walder has granted your crossing. Ooh, that's a pog right there. Walder gives them his army, save for a garrison to hold the twins, and Rob is to take Olivar as a squire, but we never see him. He expects a knighthood in a good time. Fine, fine. Which is weird because Rob isn't a knight and so can't knight anyone else, but okay, I guess Roderick can knight him. Arya will marry his son, Waldron. 
when they both come of age. I don't know why they changed it from Elma, but this is also never mentioned again. You will marry one of his daughters. This does come up again though. Rob isn't overly pleased, but there's no other choice. Now, could Kat have done better in negotiating? From what we know about Walder, Probably not, no. So the squad crosses the big funny river. Kat and Roderick wait for a battle to happen. He suggests she leave, but she wants to keep her feet on the ground. Metaphorically. As you can see, her literal feet are very much airborne. Man, the Whispering Wood is my favourite battle scene. Mm, I love this vengeful, powerful wolf mother Catelyn. It is not your sword I want. Kill him, Rob. Send his head to his father. He caught down 10 of our men. No, Theon, don't be silly. We have to take him to the Eyrie to stand trial. Jamie challenges Rob to single combat to settle the war, betting that Rob's got an extra chromosome under one of those shoulder pads. If we do it your way, Kingslayer, you'd win. Yeah, that's why I suggested it, idiot. A Game of Thrones makes it explicit how Kat's perception of Rob has changed. In the show, we just get thoughtful looks. But the war is not yet won. This war is far from over. And the next we see Kat. Proof of that is all too real. In every heart there is a room, a sanctuary safe and strong. This is so powerful. I've seen it so many times and it still gets me. I love this scene and it's not even in the song. I'm sitting here trying to analyze it, but it just makes me so sad. The writers recognize what did and didn't need to be said. Like Ned isn't mentioned once in this whole thing because there was no need. And Michelle Fairley is incredible. I cannot believe that she wasn't nominated for an Emmy. This display of grief is brilliant. See how it reduces Rob from the capable commander and strong leader we've recently seen into a crying boy throwing a rageful tantrum? I'll kill them all. Every one of them. I'll kill them all. Times of great trouble can reveal what's truly important to you. We have to get the girls back. And then we will kill them all. I really like understanding other people's perspectives and opinions, but it's so difficult to reconcile anyone thinking that this woman is simply incompetent or malicious. She's quick, smart, capable, kind, wise, and deeply, deeply passionate about her family. Like, you're entitled to an opinion, man, but your opinion is wrong. And that's okay. It's okay to be wrong. And another banger of a scene. Man, this is a good episode. I must have watched this a hundred times and it still puts my hairs on end. And I don't even care about Rob that much. The King of the North! The King of the North! The King of the North! It's just fucking epic. All the performances are so strong. It's a very Rob-centric scene, obviously, so I shouldn't dwell on it. As for Kat, she honestly looks confused here, and then what I would call a mixture of proud and concerned. She then goes to see old Jim. This scene is transplanted from the second book, but not the whole thing, obviously, because Brienne isn't here yet. Again, this is a fantastic scene. It's really the first exploration of Jamie's character. There are no men like me. As the scene just plays these characters' ideals and motivations off each other. They're there really isn't much to say, it's just some stolid ass writing. She fits in some cathartic violence, you go girl. I've always loved how quick Jamie is to admit to his crimes. How did he come to fall from that tower? I pushed him out the window. In the song, he also tells Cad why he needed Bran dead, but he's drunk in that chapter, so him being less forthcoming here isn't that unreasonable. And just like Crazy Uncle Dave used to say, I think 30 minutes spent talking about the woman is plenty long enough. Unlike some people, I don't need three and a half fucking hours. Now that we've reached the end, we can finally tackle the most important philosophical question of the modern age. Is Catelyn Stark a fierce, strong, dedicated mother doing everything she can to protect her family? Or is she a petulant, stubborn bitch unwilling to grasp perspectives beyond her own? Well, how about we do away with these reductions and afford her the complex analysis the rest of Gurm's characters get? Come on! An interesting thing about Kat's story, and the main reason that this video was a bit difficult to write, is that contrary to almost every other main character across the first installment of Dragons and Titties, she does not change. Maybe a little bit after Ned's death, but episode 10 Catelyn isn't so different from episode 1 Catelyn. Her circumstances change drastically, and with alarming frequency though, which is what keeps the story from going stale. If Catelyn Stark robs you the wrong way, cool. 
great, whatever, I don't care, and neither should anyone else. But don't let that opinion fool you into thinking that she's not a good character with a good story. Because, and here's some juicy anecdotal evidence, I've spoken with a lot of people who don't really like Cat, and still, the most heartbreaking moment of the entire show for them is this. And that's because she's a well-written character. And also the twist was built up to impeccably for three years. So you might be wondering what the point of this video was. Well, it's about cat. <laughs> I've been waiting so long to do that. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Patrons are yet to vote on the next video topic, but I have a sneaking suspicion that I'll be yelling about a handsome corpse very soon. Thank you to my top tier supporters, Aglahir, Blue Mustard, Glanus, Ingvald, Hoverarm, Stay78, Waffle, and Ondi. It seriously makes a world of difference. The cat you've been seeing through most of this video is Bear, who is sweet Robin to my Lysa. And if you want to see more photos of him, you'll find them in my Discord server. Shout out to Mango too, what a cutie.